Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so I, there's a few objectives to work through. And so I have been involved in uh, looking after people with Parkinson's now for, for more than 20 years. Um, but I'll say right from the get-go, this is the first talk I've done on the palliative care aspects of Parkinson's. So I thought we'd maybe take a, a step backwards a little bit and talk a little bit and very briefly about where we are in our understanding of Parkinson's, because I think that's very applicable in terms of how we might be applying palliative care. Talk a little bit about prognosis and then the treatment options and also the treatment limitations. And again, how is this gonna help us out with understanding what the role of palliative care in Parkinson's actually is? And I wanna use a couple of cases throughout the presentation and I'll be coming back and forth to them a little bit in terms of, uh, so these are actually patients that I'm, uh, I'm looking after right now and I have questions about them and I do not have all the answers either. So. Um, I will be interested to see what the poll questions uh, answers are. So please, uh, please participate. So um, I have been involved in uh, some speaking for a couple of pharmaceutical companies. Uh, some of them are related to some of the new products that are coming onto the Canadian market. And they just wanted an opinion about how it might fit into the Canadian market. I am involved in clinical trials uh, around Parkinson's disease and uh, uh, have many grants looking at various aspects uh, of Parkinson's disease from many different uh, funding agencies. So my other disclosure, I think is probably the most important one. I am not an expert in the palliative care of Parkinson's disease. So again, would like to hear people's opinion. The other, I think, clear disclosure is that if I don't finish on time, my wife may kill me. So that is my current front hall. And today we just took ownership of a new house and all of that stuff needs to come out of that front <laughs> hall <laughs> starting tomorrow. So, um, so first question. Um, I just have to move this over. So are, are there evidence-based Canadian guidelines for palliative care and Parkinson's disease? True or false? Okay, so as people are answering that, Dr. Grimes, there was a question, who writes your grant applications? Uh, everybody, so it's certainly not, um, I, I certainly don't write all of them, some of them. So a lot of them, we're very much involved in a lot of uh, collaborative work. So some of them I serve as PI, some of them I serve as a participant, uh, co-PI. And so it's, it's a lot of different roles. Uh, and I think it highlights the fact that we need people working together to be successful, so. It's, uh, it's definitely a broad group of people. Thank you. Now, it says on my screen, host and panelists cannot vote. That's right. I took that away from you. Okay. <laughs> so it's only our attendees that get to vote today. Excellent. <laughs> um, okay. So I'll end the poll and then share the results. Can you see that, Dr. Grimes? So 36% said true and 64% said false. So I, I think... This is one of those questions that everyone's right. So there, it's again about how you want to say that there's true evidence-based guidelines. So I was involved in the uh, putting together the Canadian guidelines on treating Parkinson's disease that was just published uh, at the end of 2019 in September. Um, and this was an extension or an update on the guidelines that were published uh, Again, I was privileged enough to be uh, involved in those and led them both uh, the ones in 2012 and these most recent ones that were published. And so we did expand on them and, and there's now five different sections. And I was very pleased at the end of uh, uh, 2019 that the Canadian Medical Association Journal uh, sent out an email saying that your guidelines were the sixth most read article just in the last three months. So I was happy to see that people were looking at them. And so in the guidelines, we actually have five sections uh, trying to cover sort of a wide swath of what Parkinson's is about. And we did actually add a section on palliative care. So there is there is a section about uh, what we feel uh, the role of palliative care is in treating Parkinson's. I was happy to see that in section four, we were able to expand that out. And in 
from an evidence-based medicine standpoint, we are able to incorporate more evidence into a lot of the non-motor features of Parkinson's. Certainly there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, but uh, making progress. The palliative care section though, um, and this is where the both true and false answers uh, play into this, is that, so this is the first statement. So we, we ranked them, there, we just ordered them C1 to C97. Um, and the guidelines um, were done in a very, uh, we tried to do it in a very academic way and, and we used a, uh, an official process that, that did rely in part on other guidelines. And so, it, so the section on palliative care, most of the statements actually came from the NICE guidelines. So these are the UK guidelines on treating actually many different diseases and, and they have some related to Parkinson's disease, they have some related to palliative care. And so this is uh, where our statements have come from with a little bit of a modification um, for, for most of them from, from the NICE guidelines. But it's important to point out that all of the statements are rated grade D, which really means they're kind of motherly and fatherly statements or, or you know, expert opinion type statements, but not really based on evidence. And so this is again where I think the idea of the answer could be true or false to the question. So again, so this idea comes up with our first statement is that, you know, we need to give people information. And one of those relates to the discussion of prognosis. And I think this really is an important point when we're talking about the role of palliative care in Parkinson's disease, because the prognosis is one of the big issues. How do, how do you look at and how do you have palliative care into a condition that may people might live 20, 30, or sometimes even longer than that? Um, certainly we wanna you know, have people involved in the decision-making. We wanna make sure it's patient-centered care, but, but how does this really physically work in, from a practical standpoint? And so I, I thought we'd start with one of my patients. So this is an 81 year old gentleman He's had Parkinson's disease for 25 years, and I have been looking after him for the last 20 years. He has been struggling for quite a while with his motor fluctuations, so it means his medications work and then don't work, and he gets dyskinesia, extra rocking, involuntary movements. And I, in 2015, discussed the option of some of these more advanced therapies, and I'll show a couple of quick slides about what these are about. So deep brain stimulation or this thing called duodopa, where we stick a tube into somebody's stomach and we give them their medication through a, through a pump and a tube system. But I sort of highlight that because that, when I'm talking about that, so he was about 75 when I was having those discussions. And, and so we usually reserve those types of therapies for people who are doing relatively okay from a cognitive standpoint and, 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 and overall not having too much trouble with some of the more advanced troubles of Parkinson's disease. So at that point, he was doing not bad. In 2018, when I saw him, he was having definitely more trouble with his balance. And that had been present for about 15 years, but he was still walking. And so this is the quote from my uh, consult at that point where I said, you know, he, in an on phase, his gait was very good with only slight shuffling component. So then as often as brought up, his wife then chirped in that his gait was rather like that. And, and often in the office, that is when people's walking is the best. So, um, you know, so although he at times was very functional with his gait, he was definitely having trouble, but he was also, they admitted at that time was having some cognitive troubles and they'd been creeping in over the last couple of years. And at that point, I was actually getting a little bit worried about how his wife was actually managing looking after him. And, and I was starting to worry about sort of caregiver burnout um, because of his increasing motor and now increasing cognitive difficulties. And I guess I am guilty as I think many physicians in terms of I then hadn't seen him. And so they didn't, they missed their follow-up appointment in 2019 and I think struggled to, to get another booking. And so I wound up seeing him over the Ontario Telehealth Network in January of this year. And at that point, he was admitted to the hospital after a fall in December and broke his hip. And it turns out that prior to coming into the hospital, he had been losing more weight. He was having increased swallowing troubles. And so his wife was spending a lot of time trying to feed him. 
And he was definitely having more walking troubles. And to the, he actually wasn't using any gait aids and it really wasn't because he, he shouldn't have been using them. It's more that he was having from a cognitive standpoint, he was having trouble actually using the walker properly, using the cane properly. So she was actually physically getting him up and then he would either hold onto her waist or her shoulders and they would walk together to wherever he needed to go. It was very clear when he was in the hospital that, and he'd been in for a few weeks when I saw him, that he was really having significant cognitive troubles. He really was not oriented. Uh, and one of the examples was that, you know, he had been talking and having long conversations with his very long dead mother. And he was having such cognitive troubles that it was unclear whether he was actually hallucinating or he just was really confused because it was really quite difficult to communicate with him. He now was a two person lift. He was on a puree diet and certainly the hospital staff were struggling to feed him. His wife was starting to be able to come in to feed him, but obviously with the pandemic, it was making it more difficult. And then it, uh, it was very clear and she finally admitted that she couldn't look after him now by herself at home. And she now wants to put in long-term care papers for his management. So, Another question. So in an ideal world, when would you have involved palliative care? So when, do you, when would you have brought palliative care into his, into his care team? And again, I said in an ideal world, I know there's lots of limitations and I think we'll go through that a little bit, but in an ideal world, when should I have involved palliative care? At diagnosis, when he started to develop postural instability, when he started to develop cognitive decline in 2018, when his wife was starting to struggle, or really it's now when he's in the hospital. As uh, people are still voting, I'll just read some of the comments. Uh, Beverly said that seeing the past deceased family might not be hallucinations, it might be a spiritual occasion. Um, and then Lisa asked if the recording and the slides will be available and they will, they'll be distributed after the session and the uh, video, the recording will be posted on YouTube and the link will be sent out. Okay. So, a palliative care team. So at diagnosis, so almost half of people, when he started to have postural instability, when he started to have cognitive decline, 16%, uh, wife starting to struggle, 27%, and then 6% now in hospital. So um, that's interesting. So I think we'll go through that a little bit more in terms of uh, how that uh, works. Um, and, uh, and certainly that's not what's happening now. Um, so a little bit about, a little bit of maybe a backtrack. So Parkinson's, I think everyone appreciates Parkinson's is common. Um, it definitely increases in incidence with age. Men are affected a little bit more than women. It is actually overall increasing in incidence. And we think it's not just because of the increased age of the population, but it does seem as though we're, we're diagnosing more Parkinson's disease and it's a little bit unclear why that's happening. So it's in part age related in our aging community, but also uh, there seems there's other factors. And so the most common quote I use is, you know, at least 1% of the population over the age of 60 is going to develop Parkinson's and that definitely increases over time. There was one question that came in, Dr. Grimes, just yeah. what's the difference between Huntington disease and Parkinson disease? So they're both neurodegenerative diseases, meaning that um, uh, they both have brain cells dying, but, but uh, Huntington's is definitely a, a genetic condition. Um, and it tends to present at a, usually on average, a, a, a younger age, so into the 40s. Um, and they usually present quite differently. So they have lots of extra involuntary movements uh, associated with it, but they too can have cognitive troubles. So Parkinson's is one extreme where classically you get stiff and slow. Huntington's is another where you actually have extra movements. And so with Parkinson's, um, we struggle with, uh, you know, diagnosing Parkinson's. Uh, we struggle with, once we diagnose somebody with Parkinson's, you know, how long are you gonna have it for? 
And I just showed this one paper out of thousands. This is from a, a, two of my colleagues, Dr. Schlossmacher and Dr. Mestre, who came up with a computer algorithm to try to help us with this. Um, and they call it the PREDICT score. Um, it's still in, a thing in development, but really just highlighting that there's people looking at this from all different uh, aspects of, you know, is there a better way we can come up with even you know, once we diagnose Parkinson's, you know, how long is somebody going to have it for? We know that over time that people with Parkinson's develop increasing problems. So the bottom, that green, the, the I guess, darker green versus the aqua green at the top. Um, on the bottom, that's more what we call non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. So these are some of the cognitive things, the mood things, can have bladder bowel problems, blood pressure problems, and certainly cognitive problems. And they tend to build up over time. And then you also have the motor features of Parkinson's. So the classic slowness, stiffness, walking troubles, and, and then balance troubles over time. And, and they definitely increase as uh, the disease progresses. There was a question that came in. Is it true that Parkinson's symptoms can vary widely from person to person? Yep. Absolutely. And so this actually is slide and it looks like a very, and it is a complicated slide, but just trying to highlight the fact that for, for a long time, we talked about Parkinson's mostly being a dopamine related system. That's, you know, deep structure of the back part of the brain. We now know that Parkinson's can affect wide areas of the brain, both autonomic nervous system problems, giving bladder bowel problems. We know there's different parts of the brain that control mood tie into hallucinations, tie into cognitive things. And we know there's many different receptors that are also used for these pathways. And so it is a more complicated disease than I think we had appreciated 20 years ago. Um, and, and again, it, it involves many different groups of cells throughout various parts of your body. So what's the natural history of Parkinson's disease? And, and, and it that's the problem. It's a huge variation. So, you know, the you see this type of slide where it's sort of this classic presentation of, you know, what we call the honeymoon period. So the first few years of the disease, it's straightforward to treat. People classically respond well to medication. But then over time, they start to develop motor fluctuations. So they take their pills, they work for a period, then they don't work for a period. And then what happens is more of these other symptoms start to, to sort of pile on to the to people with Parkinson's. And develop symptoms that may not respond so well to medications, and then the cognitive decline at, at classically at the end. If you look at the new diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's disease, we've actually taken out dementia as an exclusion to diagnose Parkinson's. So you potentially could have the, the cognitive problems right at the start. So I think that really contrasts the wide variety of, of symptoms and time course that people can have. And so there is a huge variation in, in, in the symptoms that people have at onset, as well as how it progresses over time. And so this kind of time frame is quite arbitrary, but really to show that Parkinson's progresses often over years and for especially the younger onset patients, we're talking decades. So it's a very typically slowly progressive disease. How do we diagnose Parkinson's for sure? So this is autopsies of the mid parts of your brain um, where the, the bottom slides are sort of those up to, upside down kind of Mickey Mouse ears. Um, you have that dark stained line. Um, those are where the on, actually, I'm not sure which side you're looking at, the left side, right side. Um, and then you see, you don't see, tend to see that darker stain on, on the other side. And so that's the last, the, the, the pathologists look for those last, those loss of cells in that area of the brain. And then when the, you look under a microscope, under um, sort of high concentrate or high focused uh, microscope, you see these cells. And so these are the, the classic, what are called nigral brain cells. And, and so that sort of dark spots in there, that's actually normal pigment. Um, but it's those two, uh, with those, see those dark arrows there pointing towards, these are what we call eosinophilic halo inclusions. So these are what make up Lewy bodies. And so these are the inclusions that the pathologist looks for to diagnose Parkinson's disease. And these, these actually contain a protein called synuclein. And so therefore we now, sometimes you'll see in the literature, you'll see that these 
Diseases like Parkinson's disease are called synucleinopathies because of the protein that these, uh, these structures hold. So what causes this, these cells to die in the brain? And this is, a, this is a slide that I put together back first when I first started in practice in 1999, where we talk about the genetic predisposing factors of Parkinson's and the environmental toxins, and those come together and they trigger a process in your brain that looks very complicated, is very complicated, have many different pathways. These pathways kind of uh, can interlock with each other. And, and so then, but they can eventually then lead to cell death. There's a question, so, Dr. Grimes. Yes. <clears throat> Actually, two people asked the same question. Okay. Um, so what's, how to differentiate Parkinson's from Lewy body dementia? Um, I'm going to have a little bit of a, a slide, a little bit, uh, a slide that may uh, highlight that a little bit, but I think it depends on which expert you're talking to. If you talk to now a movement disorder expert, uh, like myself, they'll tell you that there is no difference. And if you look at the fourth consensus criteria for diagnosing uh, Lewy body dementia, um, they actually include this one year differential where it's you have stiffness and slowness or you have a and then you get a dementia later um if you look at the the new uh diagnostic criteria for parkinson's as i mentioned we don't exclude now dementia as an exclusion for parkinson's disease and so if you follow both of those sets of criteria you can come up with two completely different diagnoses and so most of the movement disorder docs now argue that they really are on this, there's the same disease on different spectrums. So Lewy body kind of hits the outside of your brain, your cortex, right from the get-go, whereas classically Parkinson's gets the brain stem at the back in the in those mid-brain mid -brain Mickey Mouse ears. And, and that's what, uh, and then it spreads out from there to get your dementia later on. So again, in my mind, there really isn't a, a good separation between those two things. Okay, and then one other question. Do all Parkinson's disease suffer from some form of dementia? Again, it may depend a little bit on how hard you look and who you ask. Um, so often there is, and again, it depends on how long you live for with your Parkinson's. So, um, so, so you know, the classic young onset Parkinson patients, they typically don't have significant cognitive difficulties, but uh, when people get into their 70s, 80s, and 90s, then cognitive changes become, uh, you know, increasing prevalent. Um, and, and so it, it, you know, depends if, you know, if somebody has a full neuropsych battery, I think even in, in younger folks, you're going to find some changes. Um, so it's not necessarily universally that, that everyone will get dementia, but often there's at least some cognitive changes. Um, and so what are the role of genetics in Parkinson's? And again, it depends maybe on your age of onset. So the younger the age of your onset is, the more likely it's going to have a genetic component. And then the, the older you are, then it's, it's likely to have some, we think, some environmental or stronger environmental influences. Um, you know, these types of slides, there's, and these types of pathways, there's, there's, you know, million variations of these types of cartoons. We think now that, you know, Parkinson's does have something to do with sort of protein handling and protein recycling, how your cells degrade protein, and then the mitochondria energy producing parts of your, of your cells that are so important to, to, to get these cells to be functioning better. The genes, those red boxes, those are some of the genes that have been now identified as causing Parkinson's disease, and there's an increasing number of them, and they tie into different parts of these pathways. And so these, the discovery of these genes is helping us figure out these pathways a little bit better. And there are some therapies now that are being developed that we think uh, that, that are based on these genetic subtypes of Parkinson's. And, and we're hoping that some of these therapies are actually going to have an effect on progression of Parkinson's, but we're not there quite yet. So what is the lowest onset age that you've treated? Uh, if you can believe it, 12. Wow. Yeah. And then another person asked, can a traumatic event trigger Parkinson's uh, symptoms? No. So there, we, although stress can, can exacerbate the symptoms of Parkinson's, there's not any good evidence that, uh, you know, stress on its own could cause these types of changes to occur in your brain. Um, the other, uh, um, I guess, trauma in terms of it's one that I'll show you is, is one of the risk factors for potentially developing. So if you have significant head trauma, that's one of those things that might increase your chance of developing Parkinson's down the road. But 
Um, so I'm not sure which form of trauma they were talking about, but. Yeah, and then uh, there's just one more question. So how yeah. closely related is Parkinson's and progressive supranuclear palsy? So I'm gonna show another slide of that, but, uh, but they're, they're sort of, uh, again, PSP is kind of one of the Parkinsonisms um, and, and, and maybe it's easier, I'll, I'll answer that with a, with a slide in a minute. One of the things that, that comes out is, you know, why do these dopamine cells that hide deep down in your brain, why are they dying? And there was a nice paper um, written by Chris Getz's team uh, out of the US um, back in 2019, where they're saying it, it's really an evolutionary problem. So, you know, humans have developed a, a, and get Parkinson's because basically our brains grew too big and these poor cells that are deep down in your brain in a, in a mouse, they, they might have a hundred thousand connections for one of these cells in our, in our brains, there's more than a million. And so you can imagine one of these poor little cells deep down in your brain, that's spreading out to try to join up to a million other cells. Um, it's working pretty hard. And so anything that causes the energy factory and the protein handling within those cells to, to be affected, it's going to cause selective death of those cells. And so, you know, depending on what your genetic predisposition might be, these mitochondria, that sort of blue blob off to the side, those energy producing parts of your cell are going to run out of gas. And, and again, if you have more risk factors and potentially they're going to run out of gas at an earlier and earlier age. And so, you know, there's these environmental triggers, but there's also this whole, it was a bad evolution, evolutionary design that we have in our own brains. So what, what might trigger off these things? And again, this is a slide that I put together back in 1999. And those causes, hasn't, they haven't really changed that much um, over the last more than 20 years. So definitely age plays a role, head trauma plays a role. There's no question a genetic predisposition. This idea of what kind of toxic exposures might be out there. Again, uh, we talk about that a lot, but there's not a lot of different ones. So we know some of the organo, um, phosphate uh, fertilizer type toxins. We know those exposure to those can increase your risk, but we think there's probably other environmental toxins that, that, that it's just hard to dissect out. The immune thing is something that's coming back in to favor. And this idea of infections, it's sort of come and gone over the decades. I think most people don't think of a typical infection like COVID or any other infection really triggers Parkinson's disease, but there's a whole different process of infections called prions. And there's been some discussion over that over the last 10 years as to whether this more prion type infection might be happening in people's brains. But that's, I think, still reaching in terms of uh, mainstream, in terms of most people thinking that's a, a, a big driver. Again, you'll see these kinds of charts. There's increasing number of genetic risk factors, an increasing number of environmental risk factors, and they kind of come together for the individual person to, to generate their Parkinson's disease. This is 2021, and again, just to highlight that these pathways are still being figured out, but we still haven't put it all together. This idea of inflammation is an inflammatory role and process that happening in the brains of people with Parkinson's. There's increasing work looking at that. But again, it's, it's something that we don't have all the answers for. So if we get back to the clinical features of Parkinson's, this is one of these classic slides of Parkinson's where we think of the motor features. And I teach this to, I'm teaching medical students that still use this mnemonic trap. So tremor, rigidity, akinesia, or slowness of movement, and then the postural instability of Parkinson's that comes on usually later. But no question that that's the tip of the iceberg and there's lots of other problems that people develop with their Parkinson's and um, those become more and more difficult to treat over time. So there was just one quick question, sorry. Yep. Um, has there been any genom uh, genomics studied regarding if there are any gene mutations? Yeah, so I, I just, I went over that very quickly, but that one slide that had all those red boxes, there's more, depending on, on you're talking, talking about variations versus, you know, classic genetic mutations. So there's no question, there's probably at least 10 clear genes that if you have that genetic mutation, you have increased your risk of Parkinson's disease. Um, we're not quite to the point where we're going to do genetic testing in Parkinson's, but 
it may come to that with these, there's two uh, clinical studies right now with people with specific genetic subtypes uh, of Parkinson's, one called LRK2 and the other one called uh, GBA mutations. Um, and if those people wind up, if the therapies that we're testing at those people wind up to be effective, we're actually going to start doing genetic testing on everybody to identify that subtype. So we think that less than 10% of people will have a specific genetic mutation that causes their Parkinson's disease. Right now, it doesn't really matter if we identify them because it doesn't change our therapies, but it definitely will matter if these therapies are effective in the subtype because we're definitely going to want to know if you have that subtype or not. So, so this idea of, of the question back with PSP, so PSP fits into what we call a Parkinsonism. So anything that gives you stiffness, slowness, and sometimes a tremor is a Parkinsonism. Parkinson's disease makes up most of those cases. Um, but those other ones are definitely uh, things that I try to sort out when I'm seeing patients. So, so this idea of a neurodegenerative disease, meaning just basically brain cells are dying. And I, I think in sort of easy terms that you can split them into the people have primarily a dementia and most commonly Alzheimer's, or do they have a primarily Parkinsonism? And again, all we already discussed this idea of Lewy body versus Parkinson's disease. And I think they was kind of, you could almost draw those boxes together because I think there really are the same disease, but these other Parkinsonisms that might make up up to 20% of the Parkinsonisms. So progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal syndrome, multiple system atrophy, it's important for, from a prognosis standpoint, and I think this ties back into palliative care because those are the patients that are more likely to get into more trouble faster um, and have more issues that I think palliative care specialists could be, uh, could be that much more helpful for because these people really do run into, to, as I said, more issues with their Parkinsonisms. The overriding all of this, I think you can't forget that people still have strokes and they have small vessel disease and those overlap all of these types of neurodegenerative diseases. So, so one of the, you know, probably the only thing we can do right now from a, from a changing disease progression is make sure all of the vascular risk factors that you can treat are well treated. And certainly the, the Alzheimer and memory docs are very good at pushing these things because it's been a clear correlation. And I think we're lagging behind in Parkinson's disease, but those definitely can also play a role and affect disease progression. So again, back to the progression question. So again, we struggle with this time frame of sometimes decades of, you know, when should we bring in somebody with palliative care expertise when you're getting this increasing burden of disease over time. We know, and I think most people appreciate that there are many different treatment options for Parkinson patients. Um, levodopa, which has been around now for more than 50 years, remains the gold standard. It is clearly the medication that works the best in improving motor symptoms. Um, and so basically everyone with Parkinson's disease will eventually get on to a levodopa preparation. The problem is, is that as the disease progresses, the effectiveness of levodopa in making somebody function well all day long shortens. And that's why we get into these complicated regiments of, of medications where we're trying to maximize their on time, meaning they're more mobile, and um, trying to minimize the chance of side effects, the dyskinesia, rocking movements. Levodopa can increase confusion um, and can lower blood pressure. And as the disease progresses, those can become increasing problems. And so often over time, we get into these more and more complicated drug regimens. And I think as somebody, especially as they get to more the very end uh, uh, components of Parkinson's, how much of those fluctuations really the thing that's driving their quality uh, of life? And, and I think for some of the, you know, very end stage Parkinson patients, I think that that effect they're getting on their Parkinson symptoms, is that really the issue that's giving them the biggest problem or not? So again, with the variability of Parkinson's for some patients, I would say yes. So if they don't take their Parkinson medications, they get stiff, they get slow, you know, painful cramps. For other patients, that may be not so much. Yes, if they're not taking as much levodopa, they may not be as fast, but they, they still may not have, you know, significant pain or significant 
um, issues often at that point, they're not walking. And so your treatment goals change. And I think we have to keep that um, in mind when we're looking at somebody with the sort of terminal stages with their Parkinson's. I think it's also important to remember that although we usually, and we classically have focused on the off symptoms of Parkinson's being motor symptoms, more tremor, more stiffness, more slowness. For some people, definitely there can be more psychiatric things, more depression, more anxiety. Some people even feel cognitively not as sharp. For some people, they get more pain and, and discomfort when they're in their off phase. And for some people, they get a feeling of shortness of breath. They can have more autonomic things, drooling, swallowing troubles. Although, although those tend to be less uh, evident, they can still be a manifestation of their offs. And again, those types of symptoms, especially for the more terminal patients, are those going to play into your decision about how aggressively you're going to try to continue their Parkinson medication. So, you know, why do we run into this problem with levodopa? And, and it's again, because levodopa is not straightforward to use. So, you know, obviously for most of the preparations, it's a pill, you got to swallow it. And if you're having swallowing troubles, that can obviously limit your amount. We know that there's competition across your gut in terms of getting the levodopa uh, through your stomach wall. We know there's problems with how your stomach is actually working and emptying. And so even though the pill may get into your stomach, if it's not getting pumped over into your small intestine, you're gonna be in trouble. We know that once you get into your bloodstream, levodopa is heavily broken down. So even at the best of times, you're probably at most getting 10% of the pill into your bloodstream. And then once it's in your bloodstream, it actually, there's an active uh, transporter that sort of basically sucks the levodopa into your brain. So you gotta get it across your blood brain barrier. So there's a lot of issues with trying to get your most effective medication to where you need it in your brain. There was a comment that said, uh, a person with Parkinson that can't swallow the levodopa, uh, they, they will crush it and mix it with jam. Is that as effective as taking it without food? Uh, the effectiveness is the exact same, but that's going to come up. So we're going to talk about that in terms of what, what are our options for getting our most effective treatment into somebody. And um, so, uh, so we'll hold on that and we'll have more talk about that. And so, you know, I think it's, it's and, and this is a slide I put together, uh, or uh, a graph I put together for uh, a pharmaceutical uh uh, publication and, and really highlighting and, and I like to show it because it looks complicated and really the management is Parkinson's the motor symptoms it gets more complicated people get on to more and more complicated therapies and and this is sort of I think often turns into the art of managing Parkinson's over time that there's almost an infinite number of combination of things that you could do but over time, what happens is the side effects of all these other medications start to outweigh their benefit. And we wind up over time actually getting often back to just having people on levodopa. We do have more advanced therapy options. So deep brain stimulation is one of those things. Um, and uh, so this is typically for younger folks, usually under the age of 70, but not always. Um, and then we also have the ability now to uh, infuse levodopa. So we could hook somebody up. It's actually a gel pack. Um, and the next, uh, actually I have another slide in a sec. Um, so it's a gel pack and that winds up going straight into the stomach. Uh, and so you get levodopa in a gel and this pump then delivers a continuous infusion of levodopa into, uh, into the small intestine or the duodenum. And that's where it, it's the levodopa is best absorbed. So how well do these therapies work? Well, they work really well. And so they work way better than all these other manipulations that we can do with people's medications. And so the, there's been now uh, many studies basically showing that even things like duodopa increase people's on time, clearly statistically significant for by as four hours or more. And, and we can manage their Parkinson's symptoms quite well with it. The trouble is it is uh, something that you have to stick into your stomach directly with a tube. So there's complications The you've got pump troubles, you've got tubing blockages, you've got a hole into your stomach that can get infected. And so it, uh, it, it can be a more cumbersome 
process and it's not something that you can start in somebody sort of sort of end of life care because of uh, it is a more complicated uh, delivery system and on, it is right now the most expensive therapy we have available for people with Parkinson's. So it can cost anywhere from 50 to $80,000 a year uh, for this treatment. So not, not cheap. And so there was a question about DOPA. Who are the best candidates for this uh, pump treatment? So again, uh, people who are having clear, definite motor fluctuations. Um, there was some thought that um, you know, people who are having more cognitive troubles, who are still having motor fluctuations, they might benefit from this. But I think with a lot of the centers around the world now, we realize that if, you know, somebody who has significant cognitive troubles has a tube in their stomach, they're going to try and pull at the tube. And, and it, it, so, so we don't want people who have, you know, mild cognitive troubles are okay, but more, more significant cognitive troubles, you're just asking for, for trouble. But again, is it really the motor symptoms that are causing the, the biggest effect on their quality of life? Is it falls? Is it swallowing? Is it the dementia? So for many patients, it's these other things. And, and so it's, it's, uh, this therapy is, is not going to help those other things. There was a comment. I had a patient on duodopa infusion and it made the difference between being bedridden and being functional. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so for the right patient, it's, uh, it, it, it's an amazing therapy and, and really does work well. But it's unfortunately still the minority of patients who are good candidates for duodopa. And then just one quick question. Has this been tried in a patch format like, like fentanyl? Um, so there have been many, many attempts at trying to get levodopa absorbed through the skin, and it just doesn't work. And so you, there's not been anyone who's been able to get levodopa as a patch there are, instead of actually putting the tube into your stomach, there are some now, they have some pumps in development, leave it open pressure preparations where you, it's a subcutaneous injection. So it's just a little needle under the skin and you infuse levodopa under the skin and then it gets absorbed that way. The trouble is it, it, there's limitations of obviously how much volume you can put under your skin and also the effectiveness. So there's limitations of how well you absorb it when it's, when it's put under your skin. I just put this slide up because over time, uh, patients develop more and more complicated uh, fluctuations in their functioning. And so they can have troubles with getting going in the morning. They can have troubles where the medication doesn't kick in fast enough, where it wears off too quick, where it gets un unpredictable, where it kind of sometimes works and then sometimes they take it and it doesn't work at all. And so the, the, it can get very complicated in terms of how these fluctuations are happening. There was one question. I'm going to say the word wrong. I'm sorry. It says, what about the rotigotine transdermal patch? The people, I think they're seeing my slides. So <laughs> that's going to, I'm going to bring that up in one sec. So, so the idea of, of where are we with, you know, other therapies for Parkinson's. So if we are really struggling with giving somebody an oral medication, how about we give, even if, if levodopa in other formats has its limitations, what about other things? So a new class of medications that come onto the Canadian market um, is apomorphine. So this is a dopamine agonist. The trouble is, is that it's very short duration. Um, and so it, it may only last in the sub, in the injection form, it may only last for about 90 minutes. In the sublingual form, it might last up to two hours, but still relatively short. There's an inhaled levodopa preparation that has been approved in the US, but has not been approved yet in Canada. Um, so there are other ways to work around that. Um, the, actually, I, I guess the, the rotigotine patch is going to come up in the, in the, one of the patient questions. Um, so if we go back to palliative care and how this might apply to Parkinson's disease, and this, so this is the world, world health organization definition. And so in the, it's an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing a problem associated with life-threatening illness. So clearly, Parkinson's can have an effect on your uh, lifespan, but because people live so long now with Parkinson's, they actually, you have to look at it compared to an age-matched control group. And so if you look at different studies, there's anywhere from maybe a 50 to maybe as high as 200% increase uh, 
in mortality associated with Parkinson's disease. So it does have a, a shortening of your lifespan, but not as dramatic as I think as most people think. And again, this idea that it's, it's, you have it for a long time. And I think the other parts of the definition through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain. We have, I think in Parkinson's, and I know I, I am guilty of this, is, is this idea of pain in Parkinson's and we're increasingly recognizing that yes, Parkinson patients can have pain. I think it's still underappreciated. For most patients, for, fortunately, it's, it's more aches than severe pain, but it definitely there's a pain component to it. Um, but again, that can vary a lot from patient to patient. Um, and, and so this is a, you know, a, obviously a, a fairly broad definition that has a lot of uh, potential implications for Parkinson patients. So if we look back at, 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 our, at my patient who's now in the hospital, um, I did not have palliative care involved until uh, after speaking with his wife and the, their healthcare team, um, Palliative care uh, then became involved when he when he came into the hospital, and really it was mostly a discussion about end of life care. Um, and the feeling was that he his quality of life had dipped so much that he really was struggling from a quality of life. Um, and I, I guess one of the issues and why I brought this particular case up is I must say I felt very guilty. I think I didn't have enough discussions with the wife about prognosis. I didn't have enough discussions about end of life care, what end of life with Parkinson's means. And I think, and, and, and the palliative care, and I think the team that started looking after him and saw him in January, they're like, this gentleman's quality of life is terrible. Why, you know, why has palliative care not been involved earlier? And, and then why is the wife wanting to put him in long-term care when the whole medical team seemed to be, this is more end of life care. And I guess I had a lot of guilt about that. And, and, and I think that I probably should have done a better job, especially with her and her caregiver burnout and having those discussions about, you know, what's gonna happen in the coming months to years. But you can see that even my concern from two years ago, she was, he was still living with his wife and still functioning. And so again, I think that first question, one of the first questions I ask, I think it's still um, uh, unclear as to when, when's the best time to bring in palliative care. So is there a different way to look at this in terms of, so when should palliative care be involved? So should I have asked a question, you know, would you be surprised if your husband um, were to die in the next year, months, weeks, days? Um, should I have brought it up more when we were starting to recognize he was losing weight, declining functional status, getting frequent infections, hospitalizations, or more dramatic things like skin breakdown and evidence of malnutrition? As people are answering that, um, there was a question for a frail Parkinson's client with increased falls, hallucinations. How do you differentiate the progression of Parkinson's disease versus the need to adjust Parkinson medication dose and frequency? So that is a big question um, with, I think, no simple answer. So yeah, so it turns into a very delicate balancing act. And so this is why when people, and, and you'll see the next case, you get on a whole slew of medications. Typically, the brain tends to not to um, tolerate those other medications. So, so this is one of the reasons why you start to simplify things more and more and more and get down into levodopa. And then often sh smaller and smaller doses of levodopa because of those uh, side effects of more confusion um, and, and hallucinations that the levodopa can, can generate. So... Um, some people like the idea of a question, and, and I must say, when I was putting together this talk, I wondered maybe I should be directly asking the question more. You know, weight loss, I agree, that's a pretty tough one, and people with Parkinson's can lose weight at any time, and maybe that's a pretty late thing to be developing if they really are losing significant weight. I guess the, the declining functional status, I, I must say, I struggle with that, and so what does that actually mean? A declining functional status. You know, uh, people with 
Parkinson's are, you know, often declining functionally for the last 10 or 15 years of their disease. And so is there another way we can look at this? So, um, so there's been a few studies trying to get a sense of what does the progression, is there any predictors that we can look at in terms of who might be getting into more advanced stages of Parkinson's? So this was a study where they did a survey of patients with Parkinson's disease that were eligible for hospice care. And then they tried to go back um, and look at variables in the six to 12 months versus 18 to 24 months beforehand. So they had all this detailed clinical data and they tried to see, okay, what, what variables might come out to help us with this discussion about, you know, getting more to end of life care type discussions. And so this, they came up with this idea of suggesting a body mass index of less than 18. I actually had to look up what that meant. Uh, and, and 18 is you're, you're on the thin side, but you're, you know, 20 over 20 is sort of normal BMI. So, um, so, you know, you're, you're thin, but not drastically thin. Accelerated weight loss, I guess that makes sense. And, and I guess what I struggled with is a reduction in prescribing of dopaminergic medications as side effects at weight benefit. Again, it's a pretty soft thing. And, and you know, how much of a reduction is it when you start to think about reducing it? And so again, I found at the end of the day that maybe that wasn't that helpful a study. There are, uh, I found in the literature, this gold standard framework. So this turns out this is a UK group and it, I think it was a family physician who started this, this idea of, can we create standards of, uh, and, and, and focusing on palliative care across uh, in elderly populations to, to sort of help predict who might be um, uh, more eligible for palliative care or more eligible certainly for hospice. And so they came out with these guidelines for treating neurologic diseases in general. And you can see with these criteria, these are pretty, you know, end of life care type of uh, criteria that I think are really not that helpful. And again, I think we'd be pretty late if we were bringing palliative care into these criteria. They also did have some looking at Parkinson's specific. So the same group put together these, the, these criteria. And so again, this idea that, um, you know, looking at medication, so drug treatment becoming less effective or increasing complex. Again, that's pretty much every, every uh, patient. Um, reduced independence needs assistance with you know, their activities of daily living. Again, pretty vague symptom. They're less well controlled at their off periods. Dyskinesia, mobility problems and falls. Okay. Um, dyskinesias, I think we have to be careful because, you know, some patients might develop their dyskinesias within the first year or two of their diagnosis. Increasing psychiatric symptoms. I mean, certainly, you know, if you look at and remember back to some of those early charts, I mean, Depression sometimes starts before you even have a diagnosis of Parkinson's. So those psychiatric signs can be, you know, very, very early. And then, or if you just simply frail. Um, and, and again, so I guess I was a little bit disappointed in terms of these specific sort of guidelines uh, and suggestions helping me with my decision. Um, so why? Why don't we consider palliative care more often in Parkinson patients? So Another poll question. Because Parkinson's is generally not conceptualized as a terminal illness, because it, uh, it's slowly progressive nature and typically long survival, because we don't fully understand which components of palliative care are, palliative care are useful for, person, per, for persons with Parkinson's disease, or we do not fully understand which disease phase these palliations should apply, or we do not fully understand how to implement palliative care for Parkinson's even when we wanted to, or just simply all of the above. So as people answer that, we have a few comments and questions. So um, one person said that their experience was to have the LIN in place uh, with a case manager so that respite can be utilized with, for the caregiver. Um, there was a question, can polypharmacy often complicate the management of these patients? Uh, no question. I mean, you know, so, so definitely um, not just the Parkinson medications, but other, other medications. And again, I think the second case is going to highlight that, uh, that fact. 
Um, and and okay. so yes, we we definitely get into to troubles with polypharmacy and trying to manage the good versus the bad. I think that's one of the things, you know, in terms of respite care definitely is something that plays an important role, especially for, for caregivers. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it, it's one of those things that I think is easier said than done um, in terms of how that gets set up. Uh, I've certainly for some, some families, the respite care, uh, it just because people are so complicated with Parkinson's and their schedules that gets into issues. And, and so for some, I know, have struggled with it. It wasn't worth the the effort, and uh, and then when they get their loved one back from respite care, it, it, things are even more difficult. So, yeah. um, we we do have another question. If you assess for accelerated weight loss compared to slow weight, is it more helpful to determine when to involve palliative care? Yeah, I, I think that's a great suggestion. I think yes. So you know, if you try to quantify accelerated. Uh, Trying to have an ex if you if you see that somebody has an accelerated weight loss, yes, I think that would be a, one of those indicators, and I think that's something that I'll keep in the back of my mind as as a trigger. Um, and then, sorry, there's just one more question. So when you're ready, no, go ahead. Okay, and the last one was about your thoughts of um, palliative care versus end of life care. When do you feel like they're similar? Uh, we're going to get to that one too. Okay. Good. Good questions. Um, so yeah, so I think that this idea that um, I think all, in my mind, all of these factors play a role. And, and I know I'm guilty about, you know, why not considering palliative care more often. One of those factors is this idea of, you know, if I'm looking after somebody for, for, for 20 years with their Parkinson's, you know, if I get them in, and I know some people brought them in, you know, almost 50% of people said, why don't we bring them in at diagnosis? I think that um, we would rapidly overwhelm the palliative care docs who already are even for our advanced patients having, uh, having trouble and our palliative care teams, I think are already overwhelmed and, and what added skill set is a palliative care doctor going to bring to those early patients. And I, I'm sort of setting myself up for more questions that I'm hoping I'm going to be able to answer. Okay. So, um, so one of the, the questions that comes up, I get asked a lot is, you know, by family, sometimes other physicians, uh, you know, what stage is your Parkinson patient at? Um, and so the people often talk about the hone in your staging of Parkinson's. And, and I have my own biases against this stage. This is the scale that you will see in almost every Parkinson publication. So if you're doing a clinical trial in Parkinson's disease and you do not state which which hone in what the patient's hone in your staging is, uh, you might not have, you might not be able to publish it. But I think from a patient to patient standpoint, you'll see that this scale is all about how somebody can function uh, or, or basically walk. So, you know, it starts off, it's you have symptoms on one side, stage two, you have symptoms on both sides, but your balance is okay. Stage three, you get some balance trouble. Stage four, you're now not able to walk. Stage five, you're now bed bound. And so it's all about motor functioning, but again, the quality of life for a lot of people with Parkinson's disease is not really their motor functioning that's limiting them. If you look at, you know, what's the most common reason people with Parkinson's go into a long-term care facility? It's actually cognitive and, and, uh, and hallucinations and not the family not being able to manage that. So most of the time the family can manage the motor uh, issues um, often it's a combination of things, but again, we're not very good and we don't actually have a good staging uh, progression scale for Parkinson's. So what if we look at it from a non-Parkinson standpoint um, and we just use one of your scales? So what happens if, do you think that if we were to use a palliative care screening tool, it would be helpful? I personally know nothing about these scales and I have to look both of them up. Um, and they look like they're fairly general scales. Um, and so I must say in the palliative care world, do you use these types of scales to uh, help identify patients or is it more one of these academic scales that, that nobody truly uses? So true or false, would you think one of these would be helpful? 
And as you're as you're answering that, there was a question um, specifically about POA. How do you deal with POA of a Parkinson's client with advanced dementia for whom expectation is unrealistic, as client's mobility or cognition is severely impaired? So their power of attorney, I guess, meaning the the, the power of attorney has unrealistic expectations, uh. or. It's not, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, uh, probably, yes. Probably the POA has un like unrealistic expectations. Yeah, that, and that's a difficult thing. And I think that's why I brought up that case. I think that in my mind, the, the, you know, I think I didn't do a good enough job with the power of attorney um, mm -hmm. with, with those discussions about what, what really is, you know, quality of care and what, what are, you know, what are you really looking for? for in terms of what's going to happen at the end. And, and I think I do get into these discussions where, you know, I guess, and again, I think it's maybe my own, my own maybe being overly optimistic with people and conveying too much of a sense of hope when, when things really are to the point. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like most people think uh, a, a palliative care screening tool would be helpful. Um, and it would be interesting to see how we might uh, tie those in. And again, this is gonna come up because we're looking at, um, and I'll show you one slide about a, a new model of Parkinson's and with our new fancy electronic medical record, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do some of this, some more screening type assessments uh, where patients can fill out some questionnaires. This looks like it's more of these questionnaires, I think are more um, need to be filled out by somebody in the, in the healthcare profession to really get an answer. But I think that's something that I personally am going to look into more in terms of our own clinic as to whether these types of screening tools would help us as we get into uh, the, the progression issues of Parkinson's. There was just a few uh, comments. People are just commenting away. So I can't read all of them, but some of them say, if you think about end-stage COPD and CAD, each with other comorbidities, it's the same as Parkinson's. Um, the, PP, the PPS score is very helpful and helps to monitor decline. Okay. Um, you may be able to use uh, this for symptoms, but may need modification for this population. There's a nephro ESOS, for example, but you may need to develop something new, like through a study. So one of the things uh, that did come that, that that in my mind, you know, like if you're looking at symptoms of Parkinson's, what what you know, we know, and I've been trying to highlight, there's increasing number of symptoms. This was a study that I found where they just had a simple checklist, and they had 20 symptoms on it that the investigators thought were relative to palliative care, and they just gave it to 85 people with Parkinson's with more advanced stages, so people who are having some balance troubles and might even be bed bound. Um, when they did this, you know, almost of these 85 patients, they had almost 11 physical symptoms off this checklist. So lots of issues. More than 80% of patients reported pain, fatigue, daytime somnolence, and mobility problems. 70% had anxiety, 60% had depression, and more than 50% had some autonomic difficulties. Um, and if, the, if you look at the, the rating of when they call them really severe, pain, fatigue, constipation, and drooling were all rated as more severe symptoms. So these advancing Parkinson patients definitely are having lots of issues. And I, and I think it highlights the fact that uh, having another uh, group of caregivers uh, or care providers uh, could help uh, with these patients. Um, this was a study that I found looking at, at patients with Parkinson's and this idea of advanced care planning. When, when should we bring this discussion up? And so if you ask, so this was a study that was, had almost uh, what, more than 250, 267 patients with Parkinson's on their own preference about when they would have been liked to have asked about advanced care planning. And so 94% said they would have preferred some information early on on the prognosis and treatment. And I think I do a pretty good job of that in terms of my initial discussions. I do often bring people back in a month to six weeks after the initial diagnosis and really talk about treatments, talk about prognosis, talk about progression as best I can, but often it's quite vague terms because it's difficult. Um, 
almost 70% of patients did report they had some kind of advanced care planning uh, document in place. 50% um, wanted discussed, wanted, wanted advanced care documentation discussed uh, early on. Um, and uh, again, I think that's something that I could do a better job in our clinic of doing. More than a quarter wanted to, to have early discussions about end of life care planning. Again, I think that's a tough one to have end of life care planning for a disease that you might not die for 20 years. Um, it gets, I think that gets a little bit more tricky, um, but this idea of, of how does, you know, 21% of one early discussions of under, end of care options such as hospice. But I think that's, again, something that I think this study highlighted the fact that, that we're probably not doing a good enough job in our Parkinson's clinics, bringing up these types of issues early enough with our patients. So is there evidence that palliative care in Parkinson's actually is useful? So I already showed you the Canadian guidelines where we talked about, and again, they were only published, uh, you know, just, uh, just over a year ago, the late 2019. Um, so is there evidence that palliative care in Parkinson's is useful? And so it turns out there actually was a study that was published last year. So just, just almost a year ago where they did look at palliative care in Parkinson's disease. So I'm going to go through this one in a little bit more detail because this is the only randomized study that I'm aware of that really looks at palliative care and uh, Parkinson's that was done in a very uh, organized fashion. So they had two treatment groups. They had the standard treatment group, which really consisted of primary care and their neurologist. They had in-person or telemedicine meetings at least every three months. And then you had the palliative care group. And that so had the standard of care plus what they called outpatient palliative care. And they saw them at the same frequency at least every three months. Um, this ties back into a discussion I had. And again, I made this slide look intentionally busy. What what actually is the ideal palliative care team look like? And, and again, this depends on centers around the world. And I'm actually involved in an in a international task force looking at what is the ideal Parkinson care team. I think we all have this idea that a multidisciplinary care where every one of these specialists is sitting in a room with one Parkinson family or one Parkinson patient and all discussing their care would be the ideal care. Um, I think we can all rapidly see this is completely impractical and would never happen. There have been some uh, attempts at this in Canada and there was a very, very good clinic um, uh, that was run by Mark Gutman uh, just outside of Toronto in Markham. Um, and he had quite a few of these experts in his clinic and the Ontario government decided it was too expensive and cut it more than five years ago. So uh, I think this idealized uh, palliative care or this idealized Parkinson team is something that we're not gonna see in Canada. Yes, there are some subspecialty clinics in places around the world and I have now had many discussions with some of these the leaders in these clinics, it turns out that, yeah, these are fantastic clinics that might treat 200 people a year. Um, and, and so you're rapidly not able to treat most people. And again, most of these really fancy ones are private and of course cost a lot of money. So uh, I, although that's the ideal world, that's not really what is a, a real practical option. And I bring this up, this is a care program that we're working on with the idea that we have a care integrator. And so this care integrator tries to help people self-manage their symptoms better, tries to help steer all of those million things, the LIN, the you know, private physio, all you know, these uh, falls clinics, these, all these different services that are available throughout the region where, where, the, patient, uh, where the patient lives and how can we get them tied into all these different support services, whether they're private or public. And then we're trying to see if we can build a digital platform that helps with this, because again, people are expensive and um, it, it rapidly, even with a care coordinator, it can cost you, you know, 90 to $100,000 for one care coordinator to try to manage this, this, this patient population at a one clinic. And so can you do this digitally? And so we've developed a first iteration platform where people can do some of these modules online, again, to try to pick out what are their most important symptoms and, and is there a way to 
to help guide them through this complicated disease in, in a better way. So, sorry, that was a little aside. So if we get back to what their intervention was, it's so their palliative care team consisted of a palliative neurologist. Now this was a neurologist who had an interest obviously in palliative care and really just took a little bit of extra training to know a little bit more about what palliative care was about. They had a, a nurse, a social worker, a chaplain who were all experienced in Parkinson's. And then you also did have a board certified palliative care medicine physician. So again, the, this treatment arm, they could uh, have potentially more phone contacts. Um, they did make sure they provided after visit summaries and make sure that those were sent back to the family physician and the primary neurologist. And then um, and again, trying to tie the whole team together in a more organized fashion. It turns out this was a study that was done in, uh, at the University of Alberta and then two American centers. So, and they did do it a little bit differently. So the Alberta team, everyone met as a whole team, including the palliative care specialist. It, in the University of Colorado, they actually did it sequentially. So they'd see part of the team and work through the process. And then in the, it turns out that the California team sort of had a bit of a mix. So some patients, they did it all at once. Some patients, they would see part of the team and then work through it. So, but these were pretty long visits. So, you know, these were two to two and a half hour visits trying to work through what were the primary problems that the patient had, trying to come up with goals, trying to give them some guidance um, and, and support. And then they did have a sort of a standardized checklist uh, that each member was supposed to make sure that they went through these issues with each of the patients in the study. So pretty, pretty significant commitment. And so this is a classic flow diagram. And basically they screened uh, you know, 584, they eventually found 210. They got just over a hundred in each group and they followed the patients every three months over a year. And you can see most patients did stay within the study. I just sort of very, you know, oversight, you know, if you look, the, the groups were very similar. Um, up to 30% did have a dementia diagnosis, but their MOCAs actually weren't too bad. Disease duration about 10 years. They were definitely on the younger side in the study. So that would be a little bit unusual in most Parkinson clinics. You know, so these people really started in their 50s uh, with their disease. So definitely younger. They did have uh, just over 10% had atypical Parkinson's. So PSP, MSA, cortical basal. Most had their caregiver and and it's interesting, I think that, you know, more than half didn't have significant balance problems. And I think this ties into this whole discussion. If we're using balance as a marker of when we should have palliative care involved, I would argue that's probably not a good thing. And it's interesting, though, that less than half actually did see the palliative care medicine specialist. So they, you know, they didn't have the, the palliative care doctor. And I think that's an interesting point that that our own palliative care docs are, are, I think, are very much stretched to the limit often. And, and so maybe they don't need to see every Parkinson patient and, and still be successful. And the bottom line result was that definitely at six months, the quality of life of the patients was better if they were in the uh, palliative care cohort. Um, but by 12 months, it actually started uh, the, the, the groups were starting to become, uh, starting to come back together and there was not as much of a clear statistical difference in their overall quality of life at 12 months for those patients. But it's interesting when you look at the, their Zeroff score, so these are the caregiver burnout scores. And it, you know, when you look at the, the worst score for this particular scale is, um, is, is, is worse. So, so the control group, Clearly, the, the caregivers were having more trouble uh, compared to those who, who were in the palliative care group. And so shows you, I think, that this idea that the caregiver is a key part of this equation that we, we, I think we really do need to make sure are involved in the discussions. Um, and, and I think that can really make a big difference. And so, as I said, this is the, the, the best study, I think, out there in terms of the, the, the palliative care can have a positive effect on people's uh, Parkinson's overall quality of life. So 
Um, if we go back to the Canadian guidelines, and, and so again, these are sort of broad statements that we make about, you know, making sure that we try to get uh, discussions involved and document those discussions about progression, talk about adverse events. I think this idea of advanced care planning, I think I personally am not uh, vigilant enough with that. I think, you know, this idea of talking about future management, I think we talk about that in, in more on the, how we're gonna make you better from a Parkinson medication standpoint, but I think the idea of other management discussions. I think this idea of talking about uh, end of life. And, and again, I think as patients advance that that may be something I should be bringing people in for just that particular discussion. And then, you know, making sure that you can pull in the supports that are potentially available to patients. The other uh, recommendation, so this uh, Focus around so this discussion of palliative care should be recognized that family members and their caregivers may have different information needs from the person with Parkinson's disease. And again, I think this becomes more and more important as the disease uh, progresses. And that question about the difference with the power with the power of um, the power of attorney uh, and power of care for for the patients and who are you listening to. And more and more, especially with the advanced patients, I'm, I'm really actually focusing my discussion on the caregiver and how they're doing and how they're managing and what support they really should have. And then in the, our Canadian recommendations, we actually state that we should be referring patients at any stage of Parkinson's disease. And so we really wanted to push this idea that, you know, I think the palliative care team is underutilized in Canada. And their expertise could bring improved quality of life at any stage to our Parkinson patients. Um, and then this last recommendation was the one that I think got me in trouble in the palliative care world with this idea that, you know, um, palliative care should be considered throughout all phases of the disease um, and the requirements. And this also includes an option of medical assistance in dying. And so this was a Canadian recommendation that, that we worked with, with both, we had patients on our panel developing the guidelines. We also, Parkinson Canada definitely played a big role in uh, the guidelines and they, they too felt strongly about this being in there. It turns out that I got a very negative um, letter back to the editor after the, the Canadian guidelines came out. Um, from the head of the Canadian palliative care uh, group and, and was really very critical of, of including that statement within the palliative care section. Um, I think that in the end um, was not, didn't represent the majority of palliative care docs, but this, and I think this idea of medical assistance in dying in chronic diseases is becoming something more and more people are talking about. I personally have only had one of my actually PSP patients go through MAID. Um, and and I, I must say my own opinion about it, MAID is in the right circumstances. Um, I think it is a, a definitely an added um, care that, that uh, and, and talking to others and certainly in other neurologic diseases outside of Parkinson's and other Parkinson states, I, I think, I think uh, I've certainly been, been hearing more and more and seeing more and more that, that it really is a very, um, uh, beneficial thing to, to, to families and to their caregivers as this is a way of, 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 you know, providing the best care to patients. I know this is a bit controversial uh, for some people still, but I, I think more and more of our society is moving towards this as being uh, an option. So um, if we get back, so what are the Canadian realities? So uh, definitely Parkinson patients And so, um, you know, the criteria to get into hospice, you know, can I tell whoever that, uh, you know, this Parkinson patient is going to die in the next three months or the next six months or whatever the criteria are for this hospice care, that gets really tough. Um, and, and again, I think this ties back to long duration of disease. And again, this idea of difficulty, difficulty with predicting the time of death. Um, and again, I think this really, you know, the palliative care docs really have not been routinely involved and certainly early on in, in the disease. And again, I think that's in part um, 
relates to their own mandates within their own groups about who, who, who they're supposed to be looking after and the ministry drives, I know, some of these processes. So this gets before back. we get sorry hi yeah. so before we just go to this case um, there was just a few comments um, so could something like the ALS clinic in Ottawa work for a, a Parkinson's disease patient similar with all the different disciplines available to work together? Uh, the answer is uh, no. So the, the I mean I've struggled within our own group. To, to try to get more resources. At one point, we had a little bit of a social work assistance, but with my clinic being in the hospital and the hospital controlling the finances, um, I'm lucky that I have nurses. A lot of groups don't even have nurses. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a tough struggle. Uh, I tell you that I, the ALS clinic is changing in Ottawa. And again, that's because of the difficulty. They, have, they provide fantastic care for only a few patients. Uh, but there's a huge wait list to get into that clinic. And so they are, they too are going to be looking at how they, how they manage things uh, over time. So there was a question that follows up well at the Ottawa hospital for Parkinson clients with recurrent admissions, does medical staff discuss palliative care and our, our palliative care approach? Uh, I think that does, that does come up for, for patients in, in the hospitals. And I guess in my own patients, I do try to bring that up when people seem like they are coming into the hospital. That's certainly one of my triggers for having those types of discussions. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think not doing it enough. Yeah. So there's just a couple more. Are the cholinesterase in inhibitors effective in Parkinson's dementia? Uh, the bottom line is uh, maybe uh, I can answer that a little. <laughs> There's definitely evidence that they work. They're definitely, we put it in the guidelines that they, they can be effective, but the vast majority of patients, not really. And I think that's true for Alzheimer's patients as well. Okay, and one more, just one more. So given dementia is a component of Parkinson's, can MAID even be a consideration? Yeah, so I think that's the, the biggest limitation. And so, so, you know, is when you look at uh, those those big criteria, you know, dementia is still an official exclusion, uh, and so you know you need to be competent when you make that decision. Do you want made? I think the other the other concern is you know imminent death. So can I say and write on a piece of paper that you're going to imminently die from your Parkinson's? A lot of the times I, I can't say that, and, and so that you know from a practical standpoint um, probably negates a lot of people as made being a realistic option for them at this point in Canada the way the rules are. Um, so I wanted to just shift a little bit in terms of um, end of life care discussions and, and just highlight a couple of points. So this is another one of my patients. So he is now 75 years old. He's had a 15 year history of Parkinson's. He's um, been independent from a motor standpoint. Uh, he can ambulate uh, without assistance, but he has had multiple falls and unfortunately has had uh, quite a few fractures that he's has fortunately recovered from, but, but uh, um, they've, he's definitely had his, uh, his troubles. He has been developing increasing difficulties from a cognitive standpoint. Um, and um, even in the last couple of years when he's come into the clinic, uh, you know, some of the residents, I think because he's so animated and, and seems to be paying attention, uh, he's one of those classic people that if you just had a casual conversation, you might actually realize how much cognitive trouble he really is having. He certainly has had trouble with significant orthostatic hypotension, and that's something I've been having a difficult time managing. But if you look at my motor exam from when I saw him in May of this year, he has mild facial masking, his speech was easily understandable, he was easily to get up on his own, he took reasonable strides, I didn't see any extra involuntary movements. And so I think you get the sense of from a motor standpoint, his quality of life and his functioning, he was you know, living at home with his wife, uh, she was still managing him. She was leaving him for short periods of time on his own. So his quality of life still seem, seemed okay, um, but certainly having problems. And then he came to the emergency room or his family doctor actually sent him to the emergency room where he has this uh, very short episode where he clearly was having more trouble with his swallowing, more solids and liquids. And that's actually different than most people with Parkinson's where it's usually liquids first and then solids. And he definitely had this feeling that things were getting stuck in his, the back of his throat. So 
you know, swallowing troubles are very common in Parkinson's. And I must say, I, I'm impressed with the family physician who saw him, actually looked at the back of his throat and, and went, oh boy. And he saw a big mass at the back of his throat. So he does get a CT scan of, of his neck. It shows a very large tumor at the back of his throat going down, getting close to his vocal cords. And it was definitely compressing his esophagus and getting uh, impinging on his, uh, on his uh, trachea as well. So this was a pretty big mass. So the discussion with his wife was she was like peg tubes, not in the cards. So we had already had discussions uh, in the past about her feelings about peg tubes and, and certainly that was brought up again and she was very clear that that's not something he would want. And you can see he's on a pretty complicated drug regimen. So he's on Stolevo, which is a combo pill that you're not supposed to crush. He's on Cinemet CR, another pill that you're not supposed to crush. He's on Resagiline, which is a different Parkinson medication that has a very long half-life. Um, he's on Denepazil, so a cholinesterase inhibitor. So looking at trying to improve his cognition. He's on quetiapine, which is a uh, medication to try how to help with uh, hallucinations and sleep. He's on some bladder pills. He's on uh, um, some sleep aids with the mirtazapine that also helps his anxiety. He's on a bit of little reflux medication. So this is our complicated Parkinson uh, patient on complicated drug regime, who's now imminently going to run into trouble with his swallowing uh, and faster than most Parkinson patients would. So what are your options? So what would you do with his Parkinson medications? Convert them all to oral levodopa and crush them. And so this was brought up as an option earlier. Convert his medications to rectal levodopa carbidopa because you know he's going to have real significant swallowing troubles. Or we could put him on a rotigotine patch. And again, I kind of glazed over this earlier. So this is the dopamine agonist medication that you can put onto the skin and you can get some effect on Parkinson symptoms. Uh, we could, or we could try one of these new uh, sublinguals so he doesn't have to swallow, we can just put this apomorphine under his tongue, or we could just give him apomorphine an, an injection. So again, so he wouldn't, so we could get around him not being able to swallow. Okay, so while people are answering that, um, there was a question about falls. So what is the right approach to prevent a patient from frequent falls? Hmm. Most of the time I'm trying to push that, you know, do they have the right gait aid? So, you know, if they're falling, they probably should be using a walker. You want to make sure it's not related to something you could fix, orthostatic hypotension, something else. But again, it's tough. You know, in the past, they used to try to push, you know, fall protection type things. Some of my patients will wear, you know, knee guards to try to protect their hips, try to protect their knees. It's really, I think, moved away from hip protection, but uh, just because it's so cumbersome to get them on and off. But uh, again, there's a lot of strategies, but definitely not good enough. And then how do you respond to a Parkinson client with severe dysphagia asking about tube feeding? So, yeah, so, so this is, I guess, I guess where I'm trying to go with this case. So what, what, what are you going to do with, certainly, you know, short term, you could potentially get an NG tube. And this gentleman, you potentially could get an NG tube around the, the, the stricture, um, but, but again, it's, uh, you, you're gonna be limited. There's only a certain amount of time, obviously you can have an NG tube in. Um, but for, for many patients who are in the hospital for short periods of time, yes, definitely. So we use NG tubes a lot. I think that's an easy solution. Uh, you can crush up the plain levodopa and then um, you know, mix it with basically anything. And the nurses regularly then just inject it down the NG. The trouble is obviously it's a, it's a short term solution for potentially a longer term problem. And so I, so this is interesting. Uh, so a little bit across the board uh, in terms of what are the treatment options. And so I'm gonna try to convince you that anything but the first answer is, uh, is something that I think is not gonna work. So end of life care. So we talk about end of life care for Parkinson's. And so I brought this up a little bit. Is levodopa even needed? And I think sometimes we're pushing the idea that somebody has to be on levodopa because they have Parkinson's. But there are some patients, I would argue that, 
They're not noticing these big fluctuations. They're not having, when their medications wear off, they're not having you know, significant pain or significant contractures or those types of things. And so maybe pushing the levodopa is not as much of an issue as, as you think it might be. So I think there are some patients who maybe you might be able to look at actually tapering them slowly off their levodopa. Yes, their mobility may, is going to potentially get more effective, but maybe that's not really an issue. Um, and again, maybe the levodopa is driving more hallucinations and making them more agitated. And, and maybe again, trying to cut back on it, um, maybe help their overall quality of care. And then, so, so I would argue, I think that's something that needs to be thought about is, is that particular patient is in an essential medication for their improved quality of life. And then this idea of rectal levodopa and potentially these other medication options. These So what about rectal levodopa? I get asked about this quite a bit. And my own bias has been that uh, I've tended not to typically recommend it because in my own mind, uh, I didn't think there was any good evidence that it was effective. And so I actually tried to go through the literature for this talk and try to really see what I could find was out there. And you're really talking about case studies. And so one of the initial studies was actually in 1973 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was a case report. And they wound up, this patient was actually taking uh, plain levodopa, which we never use now. So 650 milligrams, you would never give that because we always give it combination. And you, if you use plain levodopa, you have to think about potentially giving 10 times more to get that into your brain. And so, so at that point in time, the levodopa carbidopa was still early on in, in development. So they were actually said that they could give 650 four times a day. And then they measured the blood levels when they gave it through a rectal suppository. So they were mixing it and then injecting it rectally. And they said they could get blood levels that were comparable to oral levels. But I would argue that that really what that means is you're giving, I think, closer to, you know, 65 milligrams of levodopa four times a day. So that's a pretty small dose. Um, and again, this idea that we could give it and it is absorbed quite similarly oral versus rectal. Um, I think when you look through the rest of the evidence, that's probably not true. So the, the, the biggest study that's quoted a lot is actually one from 1981 where they had took 12 patients with Parkinson's disease that were needed, uh, they couldn't take their oral medication for various reasons. And they actually then gave it rectally in, in uh, similar doses to what the patient was taking by mouth. Um, and they actually couldn't measure a rise in levodopa concentrations. And so that I think was the initial thought that maybe this strategy is not going to work. There was a publication in 2001 in the Canadian Family Physicians saying that they uh, thought that that failure was because they needed to make the levodopa more acidic and then that would be more easily absorbed. And then, so they had a case, they didn't measure levels, but they had a case where they were giving their own kind of homemade rectal uh, concoction of levodopa and they were giving it in pretty good doses. So over 300 milligrams rectally four times a day and they showed that as they titrated the dose up, clinically, that patient seemed to get better. Um, sounds at the end of the day, the patient was still having pretty significant uh, motor problems, but still they thought they were getting a clinical benefit. And so when you look at their cocktail, it was actually, they added half of it was glycerol. They actually added citric acid and they tried to get the pH down to, you know, around two. So I, I'm not sure how that would feel going into your colon, that being that acidic. Uh, I don't know enough about it, but... Um, but they felt that that was how they were able to get it better absorbed. Uh, there's a couple other, there's a couple others, you know, small case reports uh, about rectal administration. So this one, they actually were giving it the 100 slash 25 five times a day rectally, and they actually uh, could measure a level. So they felt that this measured level of 17 nanomolars um, represented, and they thought clinically there was some benefit to the patient. And they argued that 96 hours after the last oral dose, which translates into 64 half-lives, that they shouldn't have been able to measure any if it was a residual from their pills that they stopped a few days before. Um, but when you look at that measurement, 
if you were to give somebody oral medication, that's like 1400 nanomoles per liter. So you can see it's on a massive scale difference about how well you absorb it. And so I, I gotta say, I would argue that, you know, 64 half-lives from 1400, you're getting into a pretty small number and I'm not sure it's that much smaller than 17. So um, I do wonder, and we know that uh, the half-life of levodopa is actually in the brain is actually very long and, and much more than the hours that we talk about, but clinically they thought there was some benefit. So there's really not that much evidence for rectal uh, levodopa. So this idea of reticotine patch, and this comes up a lot, and I know some of my colleagues uh, use this sometimes. My own bias is that when you look at the typical dosing of reticotine, it's actually between two and 16 milligrams. So if you're gonna start somebody off on the patch, you start them off on two, that's a pretty small dose. And I put this up in terms of equivalence. So, for those of you who might use different dopamine agonists, the, they're different, definitely different equivalent dosing. But if you compare it to levodopa, so four milligrams of the rotigotine patch is roughly equal to 100 milligrams of levodopa. Or if you translate that, two milligrams of patch is actually only 50 milligrams of levodopa. So if you can get the patient on the patch, yes, you're giving them some dopamine, but it's a pretty small amount. And I would argue that, and there's no question that the, the, if you're going to start somebody on a, on a dopamine agonist and they haven't been exposed to it before, they have much higher rate of GI upset and a much higher rate of giving them hallucinations and confusion than if you compare that to levodopa. So reticotine is one of the medications I'm actually trying to get people off as they advance through their Parkinson's because of the increased risk of confusion. And this idea of apomorphine, I sort of brought this up right at the start of my talk with the idea that although we don't have to take it and swallow apomorphine, it has a very short half-life. So if you're gonna use this, you're gonna to have to be injecting people multiple times a day. You're only supposed to inject, use these treatments up to five times in a day maximum. So you're not covering the whole day anyways. And these medications are really strong GI upsetters. So we always start people and we pre-treat them for three days with domperidone before we would even consider using apomorphine. So if you have somebody who sort of needs their Parkinson medication right off the bat and you can't give it orally and you're not giving anything else to help with their GI upset, um, you're going to potentially make them sick. So I would argue that apomorphine is not a good choice. So I, I would say that that's not really an option that we can pursue, although there are new available options for people, Parkinson's, but I think for a different group of Parkinson patients. So if we get back to our patient, what did I recommend? So I actually, it turns out that after I spoke to his wife, I spoke to the team that was looking after him, I spoke to the palliative care doc, um, his wife in the end at this point thought he could still get his current medications swallowed. So we actually didn't do anything right off the bat, but I think it's quite imminent that he's not going to do it. And what I recommended in my note, to switch him off the Stilevo to plain levodopa in equivalent dosing. And then the same thing for the Cinemet CR. So we would switch him off of the 100 milligrams to 100 milligrams of levodopa. It's important to remember that's not quite the same equivalent dose, but it's close enough. I suggested they stop the risagiline right away because it's actually a fairly weak medication and and I don't think it would make much difference. And it actually has a very long half-life anyways. And then the discussion of all the other drugs, and I think this is where you folks as palliative care experts, uh, you know, are, are, you know, are very good at, you know, what, what are essential drugs to improve somebody's quality of care and what are not drugs that are necessarily needed. But I would argue that um, I, my preference and recommendation was to go down to just using plain levodopa crushed um, with the idea that when he gets to the point where he can't swallow anything, you know, applesauce, pudding, anything with his levodopa, you know, I would argue that his quality of life is probably going to be the point where, you know, he's really struggling. And then potentially that's when the more traditional end of life care management and, and medication options would, uh, would kick in. So to finish off uh, and uh, to say that, you know, I think that. This is a statement I pulled from our guidelines. In the advanced stages, the emphasis of care should shift from aggressive medical management to optim uh, approach to optimize motor function to more 
palliative care, which focuses on balancing those motor cognitive and behavioral symptoms. And um, I think in my own mind that palliative care is, is definitely underutilized for people in Canada, but we definitely still have lots of limitations, even from if we, if we wanted to have more palliative care involvement, there's practical limitations to being able to do that. I think I'm still struggling with what are the best mechanisms when palliative care should be involved. And, and my own personal bias, and I know you might hear from different Parkinson experts, um, but I think that this idea that, that I think for a lot of patients, we could get to the point where we just have crushed levodopa is I, I think the medication of choice for a lot of folks for end of life care needs. And so I'm gonna finish off with my uh, video. So I, I usually have lots of videos for patients uh, or, or when I'm giving talks to, to patients, to other colleagues. I'm showing this video in part because that's my daughter there. And I think, you know, we always have to remember the joys of life and we have to enjoy uh, our lives along the way. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to take my daughters out skiing out west. But the older and wiser is that's my, she was 15 at the time, flying down the side of a very steep cliff. And this is dad with a GoPro on his head, limping, thinking, man, that's a long way to fall. And then I also show this video because that's Rudy. So again, it's been, uh, it, I've been very lucky uh, in, in where we are, but Rudy is actually the 77 year old helicopter pilot and skier who's been doing this for 50 years and maybe reinforces, maybe we all make life decisions and you wonder why that wasn't one of our choices earlier on in life. I think Rudy's had a pretty good go at it. So any other, any other questions? Yes, so there was a question. Um, can oral levodopa be stopped suddenly if they suddenly lose swallowing ability? For example, close to end of life, bed bound, unable to swallow. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. And so, yes, we do have to be careful. And this is, I think, you know, if somebody's on, you know, 1500 milligrams of levodopa in total per day and you stop it cold turkey, there is a risk of getting into trouble with uh, a withdrawal uh, symptom. And so that used to be the, we used to do these drug holidays 20 years ago or 25 years ago, bring people into the hospital with this idea that we're resetting their dopamine receptors by stopping everything. And actually there was some deaths from doing this around the world. And so we now recognize that an acute withdrawal of big doses of Parkinson medications is a very bad idea. But I think, the idea that over time we're simplifying their medications, we think some of that withdrawal effect is more when they're on dopamine agonists and they can get into big withdrawal issues. But hopefully by the, the time you get to end of life of care, you're tapering off those medications and that those uh, you're back down to just levodopa. And I think as you're again advancing to end of life care, you're, you're probably looking at getting patients onto smaller and smaller doses. And so this idea that trickling them off, I think that if you're, you know, certainly if you're on 300 or less, uh, then it's very safe to stop it all at once. I think you're, if you're on 600 a day, maybe you'd want to go down in a couple steps. But I think that, 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 you know, there is some risk if they're on bigger doses of stopping it all at once. Thank you. And any suggestions for CBS where levodopa isn't working, CR not helpful for sleep? Um, yeah, so we, we were actually trying to start a study and we've run into troubles with Health Canada approving it, um, looking at uh, various marijuana formulations. And, and so for Parkinson patients, actually, there still really isn't any good evidence, the role of marijuana products. Certainly, I've had lots of patients who use CBD for lots of different symptoms, pain, sleep, all things. But, but again, from an evidence-based medicine standpoint, we can't recommend it. But I think a lot of people are, are trying it and, and some feel it's helpful. I, I certainly have many who haven't noticed any benefit. And what is your approach to Parkinson's disease with severe dysautonomia and very wide fluctuations of blood pressure, systolic BP ranging from 60 to 200? Yeah, that's, those are tough. Um, and actually, we ha had a discussion a few months ago with uh, uh, a nephrologist about looking at maybe shared care for some of these really complicated ones, because it's not easy. So, um, you know, certainly simplifying their Parkinson medications, probably for most patients, getting them down to levodopa because the dopamine agonists and these other medications can have more risk benefit uh, problems. 
with orthostatic blood pressure. So simplifying getting to levodopa, I use a lot of domperidone for uh, trying to prevent the drops. I use a lot of uh, mitodrine. Uh, I use a lot of fluorinef. Um, and then for some people, you're um, lowering their, so you're trying to raise their blood pressure through the day. And then at night, you're actually trying to lower it. So occasionally you've had to put on a nitro patch at night or give any hypertensives at night, but they're definitely a tough, tough group to manage. A few more questions. Has the pandemic had an impact on Parkinson's care and mortality? Are there supports or services that could reduce impact if there is any? Um, I, I think yeah, there's been increasing concern about, I think, more isolation and the issues of isolation. People with Parkinson's becoming even more isolated than some people already are. Um, I, I'm not aware that there's any evidence that the you know people with Parkinson's are are dying more frequently or something like that. Um, but but definitely um, there's that isolation factor. Um, certainly, everyone with Parkinson's should be getting the vaccine. Um, and it's probably for most Parkinson patients, it's more age related and that increased risk of death with COVID more because you're in your 70s or 80s than, than the Parkinson's itself. Are there any suggestions for management of corticobasal syndrome where levodopa has not been effective? Yeah, so that, that yeah, so that's one of those atypical Parkinsonisms that, that really doesn't respond to levodopa. And so you're, you're talking about you know, what are their main problems? Uh, for some, they get se severe uh, limb uh, limitations and sometimes pain. And so botulinum toxin into their, into their arm or leg or something, you know, trying to use traditional pain medications for some. So it's really sort of symptom management, but we don't have any better, more effective medications that can help their, their speed of movement. And last question, how would you go about tapering down Entacapone, Uh So yeah, good question. So I think that's one of the easy ones. I, I, I think you can just stop that. So, so I think if somebody's on levodopa and they're on entacapone, um, you can just stop it. So, so, uh, so for this particular gentleman, I had no concerns. He's on Stilevo. So that's, that's actually a combo pill of levodopa, carbidopa and entacapone. And I would suggest, I was suggesting we just stop that combo pill and put them on plain levodopa. So I think there's no issues there. We're good? <laughs> All right. Well, uh... Thanks so much for your session, Dr. Grimes, and uh, for all your very specific evidence-based advice. We really, really appreciate all the effort you put into this presentation and how you wove in the case studies and the poll questions. And it, it was just so wonderful. I'm sure, Brittany, you, you'd agree with this, just to see how many questions and comments there was coming in from our audience. I, I really think you set the record uh, Dr. Grimes for the most like engagement we've received from uh, questions and comments and so uh, Brittany was was hard at hard at work with all uh, reading them all out but uh, 